birds of the day. Many of them going anywhere in particular. Someone in the family said, let's take a ride. And here they are enjoying one of America's favorite pastimes. Others are starting vacation trips or heading for a day at the lake. Some are in a frightful hurry. Hey, mind your manners. Still others are in the calmest mood with no purpose in life except to cruise along and enjoy the present moment. When it's a sunny day and you have a convertible, there's no point in making complicated plans. The best way is to wait and see what happens. The breeze happens, conversation happens, and if you're driving down Patterson Boulevard south of Dayton, bells happen. Just off the busy highway, set in a manicured park, is Deeds Carillon. This slender limestone tower is one of the city's most familiar landmarks. The sound of its bells intruding majestically into the sounds of traffic can't be missed by passing drivers. Many pull off the boulevard to listen and stroll around the park. Daytonians are familiar with Deeds Carillon, which stands alone on a grassy hill. But another part of Carillon Park is tucked away among the sycamores out of sight. Here is a charming museum dedicated to the past. This spot seems remote from the bustling traffic, remote from the modern city skyline, remote from the nearby factory buildings of the National Cash Register Company. But this museum houses some of the inventions which made the highway age and the modern industrial city possible. Visitors to the museum area, such as our convertible cruising couple, pause first at the Pioneer House, just off the parking lot. This small house was originally situated southwest of Centerville, Ohio, and is believed to have been built about 1815. Colonel Edward A. Deeds, Dayton industrialist who created the park and museum, saw the house one day as he drove through the countryside. It occurred to him that incorporating it into the museum area would enable the public to see firsthand how their forefathers lived. So he bought it, had it torn down stone by stone, timber by timber, and rebuilt on its present site. The settlers who lived in this house, and others like it, were attracted to the Ohio country by stories of a fabulous land. As one early account put it, the earth needed only to be tickled with the hoe to laugh with the harvest. Family life centered around the fireplace. Cooking was done in the iron pot or wild turkeys, deer, and other forest game were roasted over the fire. The pioneer housewife used the wood ashes in soap making. The children usually slept in the attic. Imagine that you're a pioneer lad climbing the stairs to a bed of corn husks. Hear the wind and the wolves, the cry of a passing Indian, It's comforting to have that trusty muzzle loader on the wall ready for. Well, the Indians have attacked all right, but they aren't the scalping kind. These whooping braves are school children. Many busloads of them visit Carillon Park each season. The museum is popular with adult groups too. Trained guides are on hand at all times to explain the exhibits and make your visit more enjoyable. The museum's founder was particularly interested in the history of power, a branch of invention that was as important as any to the growth of the American Midwest. Water power, for example, is illustrated by this replica of a pioneer grist mill. The mechanism is made of wood, except for its two grinding stones, and may seem primitive today but it demonstrates the same principles that are used in modern industry. These stones ground the grain that the pioneers grew, so the mill was crucial to the economy of the new territories. But it was also a friendly social center. The jolly miller was often a friend and philosopher to everyone. His lazily turning water wheel, 
inspired many, many a landscape painter. Later came steam power. This spotless giant performed nearly 50 years of continuous service in the National Cash Register power plant. It is called a Corliss engine, and almost every big factory had at least one of them during the first part of this century. Although steam turbines, much smaller, now generate many times as much electricity, the engine's inventor, George H. Corliss, is certainly one of the heroes of American industry. Corliss was purchased by NCR in 1902, when the young Edward A. Deeds, later to be the firm's board chairman, was its chief engineer. That is why Deeds was sentimental about this magnificent piece of machinery, so sentimental, in fact, that he saved it from the scrap heap and gave it a miniature powerhouse all its own here at Carillon Park. was a time when the sound of that fire bell would have set off a thrilling display. When the alarm sounded, a team of highly trained horses would bolt from their stalls at the rear of the firehouse and take their places in front of this gleaming pumper. The harnesses were suspended from the rafters and it took only a few seconds for firemen to lower them to the backs of the horses. Other firemen ignited the boiler fire. By the time the engine arrived at the blaze, it had developed enough steam to pump a lively stream of water. Many of these colorful machines were active well into this century. This one served in Sydney, Ohio from 1883 to 1916. In case you've been wondering about this shiny pear-shaped part, it's a pressure reserve chamber. It prevented the stream of water from spurting and slacking off with the engine's piston strokes. In the early days of the Miami Valley, settlers had trouble transporting their farm produce to market. If the region was to thrive, something had to be done. And so begins the saga of the Miami Erie Canal. We're looking into a diorama that gives us a preview of Carolyn Park's transportation exhibits. A mule-drawn canal boat is seen approaching a lock. There's a settler waving at the passengers from the Portuguese cabin. Farther back in the scene, a Concord coach and a Conestoga wagon pass on the narrow dirt road which has just crossed the stream by a covered bridge. Toward the horizon, nothing but the rich rolling hills of the American frontier. The canal stretching from the Ohio River to Lake Erie was begun in 1825 and completed 20 years later. Travelers sat on the roof of the boat during pleasant weather, enjoying the scenery, but more than likely suffering from mosquitoes. The mule driver would periodically warn the roof sitters by calling out Low bridge, everybody down. This familiar cry inspired a popular American folk song. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, cause we're heading through a town. A section of the original Miami Erie Canal passes through what is today Carillon Park. This section had no lock, but one was moved here from north of Dayton so park visitors could gain a better idea of how boats were lowered and lifted as elevation of the canal route varied. 103 locks of this type were spotted between Cincinnati and Toledo. The canal boosted the value of land that had been almost worthless. Pioneer settlements became towns. You can see them today, strung out along what was once the Miami Erie right of way. Today, cars and trucks carry passengers and merchandise over the canal route in many places. In Dayton, Patterson Boulevard is built over the old right of way. Thus, in a sense, the canal still lives, still transports our people and their products. Expansion of the railroads gradually forced the canal out of business. It was officially abandoned in 1877. Another historic means of transportation illustrated in the diorama is the Concord coach. It is roomy and grand with rhythm in its roll and the play of its wheels. It is poetry in motion. That's the way one early traveler described the Concord, although it's doubtful if he had ridden cross-country in one. The body rested in a shock-absorbing sling. 
yet it must have pitched violently when the wheels dropped into an unexpected ditch. 12 to 14 ox hides went into these slings. The Concord, so-called because it was manufactured in Concord, New Hampshire, was the craftsman's delight. It was entirely handmade, white oak for the spokes, hubs of elm, its gracefully curved body of the finest basswood. Poetry or not, coaches like this one played a key role in the growth of the West. And so did the Conestoga wagon, although we can dispense right now with the poetry argument. Historians call it simply the freight car of the turnpike. Nothing poetic about its rhythms, although we can marvel at its ruggedness. The wagon originated in the Conestoga Valley of Pennsylvania. It became the standard means of transport for the westward trek in the early years of the 19th century. The body is high from the ground to overcome road ruts. The curving shape of the bottom held the cargo in place on steep mountain roads. It could even float when forging a stream. It does resemble a boat on wheels, doesn't it? Wheelwrights competed with each other in making the toughest metal sheathed axles. One reason the Conestoga survived the worst punishment the frontier could inflict. This pot contained axle grease. The wagon driver usually walked beside his horses. If he rode in the wagon at all, it was on this lazy board. No feature on the Conestoga wagon was more colorful than its bells. Each horse carried a full set to warn travelers on the narrow wooded trails. You've heard the expression, I'll be there with bells on. It dates from the era of the Conestoga. If a wagon got stuck on a muddy road, it was customary for its driver to award his team bells to the rescuer. A driver who felt he could make a difficult haul without help would say lustily, I'll be there with bells on. The word stogie is commonly used today too. Conestoga drivers usually smoked long, cheap cigars and since the Teamsters were nicknamed Stogies after their wagons, all cheap, foul-smelling cigars finally came to be called Stogies. In the diorama, the miniature Conestoga wagon had just crossed a covered bridge similar to the real bridge that visitors see in Carillon Park. Why was it covered? To provide a refuge from storms? To keep the horses from shying at the sight of water? To assure privacy for courting couples? Sorry to scuttle romance, but the real purpose of the roof was to protect the floor planks from the weather. The automobile made the covered bridge obsolete. It just wasn't wide enough for the speedsters. put the Conestoga wagon, the Concord coach, and the Miami Erie Canal out of business. And here's one of the locomotives that helped launch the railroad era. It is housed in the Carillon Park building called South Station. The up and down motion of its driving rods suggests the action of a grasshopper's legs, hence the name grasshopper. This clanking monster was designed by the fine hand of one Phineas Davis, who was believe it or not, a watchmaker by trade. One thing is certain, he didn't assemble it with a pair of tweezers. Davis entered the original grasshopper in a Baltimore and Ohio railroad competition in 1831. It won $4,000 as best in show. From that prototype sprang a whole fleet of engines. But the grasshopper had its day too and was replaced by bigger, more powerful locomotives. One of the newcomers, the Cincinnati, the first locomotive to pull a passenger train into Dayton. The funnel-type smokestack had a built-in screen to trap sparks so they wouldn't set the countryside afire. The Cincinnati's historic first run into Dayton took place in 1851. This handsome antique is a 1912 Cadillac. It is fitted with the Charles F. Kettering inventions that revolutionized the motor age. 
Before Kettering set to work on his self-starting system, motoring was a bitter experience. The only easy thing about it, honking the horn. As for starting the gas buggy, well, many an arm was broken by a cantankerous crank. Look out there, or you'll be in the same predicament this fellow was in. Man Against His Machine was a favorite theme of cartoonists during the early days of motoring. Kettering didn't think breaking an arm was a very funny joke, though. He thought the cranking could be done by electric motor safely without back-breaking labor merely by kicking a switch. Thus, the automobile was transformed from a new gadget into a practical means of transportation, linking Hamlet to city and bringing about sweeping commercial, social, and cultural changes in American life. A new industry, the Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, was founded by Deeds and Kettering to mass produce the starter. Today, the firm is known as Delco. The airplanes shown in this historic film strip are powered by the famous Liberty engine. The Liberty, developed during the early stages of World War I when Colonel Deeds was chief of Army aircraft procurement, is among the many exhibits at Carillon Park. This engine, along with the antique Cadillac, is housed in a replica of Deeds Barn, the Dayton building in which the self-starter was invented. The starter, sponsored by Deeds, sent both Deeds and Kettering on the road to wider careers. Deeds as an outstanding industrial builder, Kettering as one of the great industrial scientists of his time. Wright Hall at Carillon Park is dedicated to the men who achieved the miracle of flight. The Wright brothers, they had the searching intelligence of scientists. They had the inventor's talent for making their theories work. They had perseverance, and they had great personal courage. Together, they achieved what men had pursued for centuries. When it was decided to honor the Wright brothers with an exhibit in Carillon Park, Orville Wright himself suggested that the original parts of their 1905 airplane be found and reassembled. 60% of these parts were located in museums and private souvenir collections, and Mr. Wright dug out the original drawings. The result is this authentic, beautifully rebuilt plane. Long before the Wrights, men had developed theories of aerodynamics, most of them incorrect. So Wilbur and Orville started at the beginning, and here in Wright Hall we see their major experimental devices. Into a crude wind tunnel, they inserted metal fins of different shapes to see how they would behave. Some of their experimental equipment was made of bicycle spokes and old hacksaw blades. The inventors mounted a wheel on the front of a bike. Attached to it were these metal vanes. As the rider sped along, he was able to study the effects of air pressure on different surfaces. Within a few years, the Wrights had solved the centuries-old problem of flight. If you had lived in the early 1900s, you might have witnessed the birth of aviation. And how did it look from the pilot's seat? This may give you an idea. You might have missed the drama of the early flights, but you can appreciate the ingenuity that went into their planning. At Carillon Park, a guide shows features of the 1905 plane to our mechanically minded young visitors. Wrights banked this craft by warping the wings. The pilot flew on his stomach, shifting his hips in this padded frame to alter the degree of warp. The principle suggests the ailerons of modern planes.
engineers who saw the 1905 plane during reassembly marveled at the craftsmanship that went into its original construction. Indeed, the Wright brothers left nothing to chance. They were great scientists, great inventors, and great builders. Those who inspect this plane are bound to appreciate all three aspects of their genius. The airplane will stand for all time as one of those truly great inventions which have shaped the life and destiny of man. Mrs. Edward A. Deeds was as fond of music as her husband was fond of history. The Carillon, the centerpiece of the park, is her creation. This granite and limestone tower was dedicated in 1942. It was the first Carillon to have all its bells fully exposed, their sound unmuffled. The tower, which rises 151 feet above the terrace, supports 32 bells. The largest is six feet in diameter, the smallest a foot and a half. Mrs. Deeds supervised the arrangement of more than 400 selections so they could be played on the carillon. Also incorporated into the structure is the Celestron, a high fidelity system that broadcasts recorded music over the park. The public enjoys Carillon and Celestron programs each Sunday evening from June through October. Easter sunrise services are also traditional at Carillon Park. The historical exhibits may be seen daily except Mondays from May through October. Guided museum tours as well as the outdoor musical programs are free to the public. The Deeds Carillon is truly a landmark of history. Let it guide you off the busy boulevard, through the pleasant trees, and into America's past. 